And let me uh, read uh, God's word to us. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Great, Steve's going to be uh, opening that up. I've got a bit of a nervous twitch today. I think for the first time in 15 years... Of pastor in this church, I've had a Bible passage read, and I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm like, oh, it really gives me the nerves, because what we do here is we open a particular passage of the Bible, and we work through it verse by verse, don't we? And we all pretty, say pretty confidently that uh, this is what the Bible says to us. Well, we're doing a theme today, and it's on the theme of singing. And I'm hoping it's not at odds. And you say, Steve, why do you pass, uh, pick Psalm 100 to be read? Answer, I like it. <laughs> it's good. It's a good psalm. But we're probably not going to even get to that until three weeks time, four weeks time, when we come back on our second round through on this series of It's Just What We Do, Praying, Singing, Giving. So we're gonna do, we've done praying. Today we're doing singing. We're doing giving next week. We've got Tim Lane the week after. Then we're going praying, singing, giving. Okay. And if at the end of it, as elders, we feel like we still as a church haven't got it, guess what we'll do again? Remix, baby. Brilliant. So listen, join with me as I pray, as we think about this joy, this privilege, this thing called singing. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that we're a church family together. Thank you that we've been able to gather this week and lift our voices in prayer, seeking you, expressing our dependence, celebrating and speaking to you of your truth and all the good things you've done through Christ our Lord. And now as we hear what your word, the Bible, has to say, help us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I know I'm not going to go too far wrong today, purely because uh, I've basically done a summary of this book worth a read. It's called Sing. It's by... uh, Keith and Kristen Getty, they've written a lot of our songs like Come People of the Risen King and stuff like that. Andy, you've read it. What do you think of it, mate? I wish I'd read it when I first became a Christian. It's that important and that good. So I'm sort of doing a bit of a book, book summary, uh, and, but doing it Speak Baptist Church style, okay? So let's just dig in and talk about something. Some of you won't even know what one of these are, okay? And this will age you. Michael, sit up. You're listening to God's Word. Sit up. Good lad. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, if I say the phrase mix tape, Jay, do you have a clue what I'm talking about? No. Peter, do you have a clue what I'm talking about? Oh, he does, because he's that generation. You see, up until about the year 2000, the only person who'd heard the word playlist was a DJ, because they have a playlist at the radio station. Okay, of course, now we have playlists left, right, and center. I want you who are younger to think ancient old crusty people's version of a playlist and what you would do is you would listen to the radio with your fingers poised ready to press play and record button on your twin tape deck and you'd get the song that you wanted that you couldn't afford to buy as a as a single record down at the local asda or hmv and you would press play and you'd, you'd listen to it and enjoy it and hope that you could press stop before the DJ started talking again over uh, on the radio show and you would have your song to listen to no such thing as as uh, well Spotify and whatever uh, other there certainly wasn't an Alexa around but that wasn't the mixtape no no the mixtape was when you found that one special person and a way of sort of you wouldn't just be talking you would have probably said will you go out with me okay And very soon, usually within a seven-day period, was the expected period of time. What would we make for them, Peter? A mixtape. We would gather together all of the songs off the different tapes, and we'd use our double tape back deck and high-speed dub it across, and it would be our favourite songs. And we would... (laughs) 
would you like my mixtape? And it, who, me? Oh. And you say, why is that such an important thing? Because music, music captures something of the deepest parts of us. And the music that we connect ourselves to expresses us. It tells us something about who we like. The songs that we would put on our mixtape are celebrations and they shape us. Have you got a song, perhaps? Of course you have. You've got songs that when they come on the radio or they come on your playlist, it prompts memories. Are you thinking of one right now? It transports us to another time. Or it communicates something of what we were feeling or wanting to feel at that moment. It expresses a little bit of who we are. You see, what we sing about tells people our story, who we are, what we aspire to, where we find hope and comfort when things are difficult, who we want to be. Music and singing is written into us. Imagine Imagine a world without music. For some of you, singing in church is the most painful part of the service. I mean, listening to Stee Whittle on for a bit is bad enough. But when the music comes, oh dear. Maybe because you've had a bit of a bad experience. Um, Maybe it's because you fear you're the odd one out and you're the only one who can't sing. Maybe it's that moment when you become super self-conscious. I think there's actually an added difficulty in Liverpool. And you say, hold on, isn't Liverpool a musical city? Yeah, it certainly is. Isn't it okay to sing in Liverpool? Yeah, about certain things. Now, I've done youth group weekends away and have been part of youth groups in multiple locations around the country. And if there's one thing I notice, there are... There are things here in Liverpool, as somebody who's not from Liverpool, that if it's not socially acceptable to show enthusiasm towards them, then you just go cold and quiet. More so than in other parts of the country if you're a young person. So I think there's an added challenge for us here and speak about that. Sometimes singing in church is painful because there's somebody who was there who's not anymore. Or you've just had a tough week and it has sort of tightened your vocal cords. Sometimes it's that distractions, and some of us, aren't we prone to being closed down by distractions? There's a kid at the end of the row who's picking his nose. There's somebody who's got bad breath. There's somebody who's making a really funny noise. You've got the kids running around and the idea of focusing on some sort of singing is just, no, there's... And then you hear things like this from the Bible. How frustrating. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Okay, I can do that sometimes. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord intends. That we will be singing vocally making music together from where from the heart and some of us sit here and go i'd really be happy if that part wasn't here i suppose at this point we need to ask ourselves whether we know better than the lord or not and some of us though in this room have got a different story you love to sing and it's a disappointment that as a church we haven't grown more in doing that i think it's one of the areas in our church life where we have got potential for a lot of growth I went to uh, preach at a church, uh, uh, Grace, over in Halewood recently. Similar sort of congregation size, similar sort of room size, just two guys on a guitar. And when I was preaching there, the noise the congregation made, I I was like, whoa! And there was a sense in which I was a little bit jealous. And I felt so encouraged in the singing and the lifting of the voice. And I was thinking, "I, I wonder how much... In mutual encouragement we've cut off from ourselves as a congregation here. I think our musicians do an amazing job, but I think we've got a scope for growth 
in this, particularly as somebody who has a tendency on a Sunday morning to look around and see what people in the congregation are doing. I think we've got potential for growth. Some of you love to express yourself musically, but you're heartbroken when others don't or won't. You feel if we could just make more of the music time here, there would be more fuel for our spiritual lives in the future. For you, you, you just feel like saying singing, it's just what we do, but I just wish we would do it a little bit more and grow in that. I think this book's really interesting because it sort of set, sets out a few aims for itself when it says sing as the title of the book. It says, really, by the end of the reading of this book, what I want to do is be able to discover and help you, the reader, to discover the joy and privilege of singing to one another and to the Lord. Consider the impact on our hearts if we do and we don't sing. Cultivate a singing culture that expresses your church, whatever it's like. Equip a wholehearted singing to express our unity together that tells a story and is a witness to the world outside. And I think those are basically good aims. That's what I want to see happen. So we're going to look at it under three titles today. These are the titles of some of the chapters in the book. They're very easy to remember. We're created to sing, we're commanded to sing, and we're compelled to sing. We're created to sing, we're uh, commanded to sing, and we are compelled to sing. So listen, let's look at this straight off. First of all, we are created to sing. God formed our hearts to be moved by music. Is there anybody here who's never been moved by a piece of music? Of course you have. God formed our hearts to be moved by music with a deep depth of feeling and range of emotion as a melody carried series of truths strike us about anything But he intended it ultimately to be about him and what he's done. So it's okay to to sing a love song. Every culture in the world sings love songs because they're, they're praising another for whom they have affection and delight and see worth. But it wasn't always designed so that we could praise one another, although that's perfectly okay. There's plenty of examples of praise songs of other people in the scriptures. We were designed to be caught up in music and the truth of who God is, to sing it to him and amongst one another. And some of you are sitting there and going, yeah, I agree with that theologically. Yep. But not me. This is awkward. This isn't my gift. It's not my gift to sing in a group. Wrong. Wrong. If you can speak, if you can physically speak, you can physically sing. Oh, I'm not suggesting that you can sing like some people who are more naturally gifted to sing. But if you have a voice, you can physically sing. You were designed to sing and God has given you everything you need. If you don't think what he gave you is good enough... Take that up with him. But I suspect he'll say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Why? Why is it that you can sing? Back to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Christian singing starts not with the lips, but with the heart. Not with the vocal cords, but with your soul. So if you're somebody who says, no, singing is for somebody else, that's an issue of the heart, not the voice. It's an issue of your heart being caught up with your own self-consciousness or nervousness, dare I say stubbornness, Genuine fear, had a bad experience, whatever it may be. Remember, the Lord has created you to sing. And I'm not denying that some sing better than others. Psalm 98, which is near 100, so that's close enough. Psalm 98, verse 4 to 9. Oh, hold on. 
He's made the whole world to sing, and we're the high point of creation. This is what it says. For gr- oh, no, wrong psalm. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Your heavenly Father cares whether or what you sing, but not how tuneful you sing. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Some people have a special gift to be able to sing every single note off pitch. Is that you? Anybody want to raise your hand? No. I learned this week that it is nigh on impossible to sing every note off tune. You can sing most of them. You'll know this if you stood next to Dean, who's not here. But who sings the best in our church family? Dean. Let me let you in on a little secret. Sometimes Bethany finds it hard when she's been singing to come in and sing at the front and lead you. And as an act of worship, she takes herself in hand and she says, I'm not doing great spiritually this week or I feel really sorrow." sorrowful or I'm just in a bad mood or I've got all other stuff but she stands there and she sings and she tries to do it as best she can with a glowing countenance and she's in maybe once or twice she's come to me and she said I found that so hard to do but as I looked out on the congregation I felt like I was the only one doing it except Dean <laughs> And he was there at the front, and I could sing him, hear him singing out of tune, but he kept me going. Is that the church we want to be, people? Leave your junk at the door. Come in and throw your heart where it should be, even if it's not quite there. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, for that is what he's created you to do. We sing knowing that our Lord's ears are open and listening as we lift our voices to him. We sing to God and about God for the benefit of God's people as well. So let me just ask you this question. What do you experience during congregational singing? Joy, fear, indifference, freedom, self-consciousness. What do you experience? And what difference does that make when you hear that the Lord created you to sing and he delights to hear your voice lifted towards him? First point, created to sing. Uh Uh-oh, commanded to sing. Let's just say it. We believe that every one of the commands of the Bible is for our good. Do we get that? We don't obey God's commands to make him love us because our obedience isn't good enough. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all righteousness for us. We don't obey his commands to make him love us. We obey his commands to enjoy his love of us. Do you see the difference? But make no mistake, we believe every command is for our good, but we also know that to choose to disobey is to choose to suffer or to make others suffer. So there is something lost when we don't obey. So here it is. In Scripture, we are commanded to sing, and to not sing praises to him is to disobey. I'm talking vocally. 
And I know for some reason we've always, when we come to, in, in Scripture to something that we're commanded to do that we don't like the look of or feel that we shouldn't have to, what we do is we rack up all our excuses. Oh, it's for the, the keen gifted ones. Or I'll find some sort of reason why there's a subnote in the, in the Bible that says, this is for everybody else but me. Can I tell you that that's not the case? Psalm 149, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. There are over 400 references to singing in the Bible. At least 50 of them are direct commands. So if you struggle right now, be praying, Lord, I'm struggling as I listen to this. I'm trying to grapple reasons why this doesn't apply to me. I'm trying to find reasons. Please, Lord, soften my heart. Some of you are listening to this and going, well, I don't seem to struggle in this domain. I love community singing. I think this is absolutely great. I want us to do more. Then you need to be praying, Lord, guard me from a self-righteous, prideful heart. Because if there are people in this room who struggle to sing, then it wouldn't be very difficult for them to point the fingers back at what you struggle with. We're going to be a faithful, growing community. I ask myself, what do I expect? Do I really expect that if I read out a command from the Bible, suddenly at the end of this service, everybody will be like, Listen, I'm not that stupid, but for some of you, if you don't at the end of this service come out with a, then that's a sign of real spiritual stubbornness. You need to be asking, what would the Lord have you do? We do it communally. Wow. Wouldn't it be easier if we could do it? Can I, can't I just do it with my um can't I just do it with my in the car when I'm driving somewhere or with my iPod on with the door closed? No, sorry people, it's communal. And that requires that we lay down our taste and preferences. And I it's just wonderful the diversity of preference. I was thinking about this this week. There are some songs that my wife loves to sing. I hate it when she asks us to sing these because she comes from a choral tradition where the and I just I can't do it. I'm like I'm t- obviously. And there's ones that she hates singing because it's basically three chords, two notes, and bland. And she's like, ah, 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 ah. and she's like, there's more diversity in music than this. Some of you want an awesome beat behind it. Some of you won't sing unless there's a guitar. I don't, I would just, and you're like, that gives me an excuse. This isn't my kind of music. I don't like it. Can't I remind you of the gospel dynamic that says what we do is we submit to one another our preferences and we come with an attitude to serve. I mean, isn't that why we sing some of the kids' songs? I mean, most I take it most of you don't want to sing. Why? Why does the? Uh, why do you sing it? Those of you do, because it helps the kids. Now, please, I was thinking about this this week. I I I want to I want to diversify our repertoire. If there is something that blesses you and it builds your soul and it helps you express praise to the Lord in that musical style, and we don't do it here, I, I'm like, I want to serve you. So if Joe wants to come along with his dubstep and go, wah, 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 oh, 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 and all that kind of thing that Joe likes to do, I can you imagine? Alma will be like this. Yeah! Because what we do is we want to encourage one another spiritually. We are supposed to, it's supposed to be that way because in our... Listen, unity isn't uniformity. Do you get that, people? We will express our unity in our willingness to serve one another in the way that we sing, the kinds of songs that we sing, with an openness to say, I just want to bless. You know, I, 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 need, I need Weston to come along or Alice to say, how would you do it Malawian style? Okay. I need, I, I need a South African to tell me how we sing. You know, I need some of Cockney. Okay. I need somebody, I need a valley girl. How should we do it? We need teenagers. Oh, no. Dare I say it? We need the teenagers to say, what, what worship songs have blessed and helped you? Let's sing them. If that's how we sing communally, it's it's what we sing. Remember, this is what we... Colossians chapter 3. Flick there. Colossians chapter 3. 
and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. As you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your heart to God. What do we sing? Stuff that is rich in Bible truth so that the melodies connect our heart with the truth. And sometimes music does that in a very unique way. Can I demonstrate that? Ben, you're going to have to get your fingers at the ready, laddie. So I was feeling pretty low. And I came into my office one of the days this week and I was reading my Bible. And sometimes you know those moments where you're reading your Bible and it's almost like concrete and it's bouncing off and I'm going out. And I'm, I thought, right, okay, let's just put some music on. And I clicked on an old album by uh, a group called uh, Indelible Grace. Do you want to click it up here? And I was feeling pretty low spiritually. And this came on. Just press play and we'll probably see some. Oh, just kick it over to the start again. There you go. And then crank up the volume a bit. Just pause it. What was the first words I heard? Come ye sinners, poor and wretched. And I nearly cried. Keep going. That's true. Stop it, or I'll cry more. I was like, yes! I feel crap! I'm sorry, that's not being recorded. But he is able, and he said I can come. And the music is pretty cool. Put another, the next one on. Okay, the next one. And then, me and Jane, we were feeling pretty bad not so long ago. I'll just uh, Don't start it yet. Okay, put it right to the beginning if you would. And uh, we were at a conference, and we were feeling pretty awful. We were feeling pretty low. And feel it, you know, doubts and fears were there. And um, this song came on.
Now, that, oh, we were there, and the, the community was singing. I didn't know how to sing at the time. And the community were there, and they were singing and lifting their voice. And the Lord was getting glory. And those are a couple of songs that are helpful to me. And when I come in on a Sunday morning and people have made the effort to sing, wow. Now don't get me wrong, there are times when I might hear those songs, no dent at all. And the aim isn't to have a big dent, like, but it's to connect our hearts with the truth through the gift of music. Don't we want to be a church where we do that? Not fancifully? Not in a contrived, performance-related way? But we're there singing the truth of God into one another's souls. And that's why we're commanded to sing. Page 18 of my book says this. What is happening when we sing is about so much more than the audible sound we create. But certainly not less. How we sing does reveal how we think and feel about something. Most of us will all sing with some grit in a sports stadium or in a happy birthday at a loved one's party. Our individual personalities join up to make a collective personality. And our individual grateful hearts come together as the church. So as we obey the command to sing, we are, or should be, unleashing a congregational sound of conviction. Whether there are a dozen of us, or a thousand of us, if we aren't, our children or visitors looking on have every right to wonder if what we are singing is truly important to us. In this sense, our singing betrays the truth about us, for better or for worse. Does that sound right to you? Of course it does. So we are created to sing, we are commanded to sing, and finally we are compelled to sing. C.S. Lewis, we have to get a quote in on him if we're going to talk about singing. He says this, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise merely doesn't merely express but completes the enjoyment. Do you see that? Have you noticed that when you're eating a really nice piece of cake? You're like, and you look to somebody near you to be able to say, this is really good. It's something about the the offering of praise of it that, that adds to the enjoyment. I love to praise my wife because I enjoy my wife and I feel even more enjoyment as I praise her, whether it's your kids or something else. Some people want to go and announce how well a particular footy team did or an experience they had or show their holiday photos or whatever it may be. As we sing the praises of something, we... The Lord has designed it that way, that we enjoy it even more in the praising of it. It's why we create art. It's why we create music. Handel's Messiah would never have been such a beautiful piece of music if he had not had in his heart something that he wanted to to declare praise for. What was that? The Lord. The Hallelujah. So since God is most worthy of our praise above all things, since he is most deserving of our love above all other people, we find all over scripture people just bursting into song. Let me give you a few examples. One of the earliest songs in scriptures is uh, in Exodus chapter 15, the song of Moses, where after the, uh, they've been rescued, the Israelites, from Pharaoh, they've been brought through the Red Sea, they just bust the rhyme and burst into song. And what are they singing about? The greatness of God's love and his victory over the enemies and his ability to deliver. They're just like, this is awesome! Let's sing about it! They're compelled to sing. 
Later on, as we move through the New Testament, there's regular occasions where they stop to sing when the Lord has done something great for them. In some sense, you can tell that, the Lord, that, that they've got what the Lord has done for them by their willingness and their ability to sing. All the way through, all the, way through the Psalms, what we have is a series of so- songs that process life in this world. There are songs that declare his praises for his present rule or his covenant faithfulness. There's songs that express their desire that the Lord would be their refuge and their hope at times of struggle and pain. There are songs about doubts and there are songs about unbelief. There are songs uh, making sense of what they're going through. And they do it all before the Lord because they believe him to be a present reality. So they're singing about him as they interact with life. On into the prophets there is singing. Zephaniah 3 says this, Sing aloud, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with your all, your heart. There is an exuberance compelled almost by an experience of God that makes them want to sing. And then what you've got is all the way through the New Testament into the book of Revelation. You've got singing just bursting out all over the place. The angels who see spiritually th- spiritual things very much clearer than we do, they're always bursting into song and praising the Lord. But do you remember the, the multitude at the end of time, and we've got a picture as to what our destiny is, all the way packed away in Revelation, right towards the end, in, verse, in Revelation 19. After this I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! It's a hallelujah chorus. And there is praise bursting out all across the throne room of heaven. So what is this Bible message today going to do with us? I think firstly I wanted it to set a vision. I know life comes at us and I don't expect everybody to come in every Sunday morning with an expectancy that they're going to be leading the corporate singing. It's okay for us to have off days. But I do think that if you love the Lord Jesus, you will have come with a desire to lift your voice and bring your heart in line with the truth, whether you feel it or not, in line with the truth, that your heart may land where your voice is, that God may get the praise and that people around you might be encouraged. Some of you need to know this. Um... If you've never thrown your voice out like that, that could be a sign. It could be a sign that the greatness, the glory, and the wonder of Jesus is something that you're holding at arm's length. It could be a sign. Some of you are like, well, I've 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 just got into the habit. Have you noticed how how when habits set in, we almost get so used to it, we don't know how to break out of it then what you do is you throw your voice. Maybe one of the greatest enemies we have in our church is is half-hearted singing. And your mouth is moving, but you don't concentrate on the words, and you're easily distracted, and you're one of the first to sit down when the music stops. It's like, good, that's over and done with then what faith for you today might look like is standing there, concentrating on it, and taking the volume up a couple of notches. So that somebody near you might hear you. Oh, it suddenly becomes There's something at stake there, isn't it? It's usually when things are at stake that you can tell what, really value, what, what you really value. Some of you sit there and go, well, I'm not going to sing unless I feel it. I feel inauthentic then if you obey your feelings in all other domains of your life, then things aren't exactly going to go wonderfully well all the time. And what we do is we recognize that the gift of music has been there, given to us to help draw our feelings in line with what is true. 
So like you have to do in so many other domains of your Christian life, what you do is you throw your voice where you want your heart to be. And as you throw yourself into that and give yourself to it, guess what? Sometimes your feelings follow. Sometimes your feelings aren't there because it's the wrong kind of song. So there's like, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say rejoice. And you come in and you're in sorrow because there's been a terrible thing that has happened recently or somebody has hurt you or something there. And that might not be, the, it might actually be the right one, but it might not be. And that's why we work quite hard here to try to have a variety of different songs that communicate different moods, just like in the Psalms. But even if we haven't picked the right one for that day because we're not omniscient, the best thing you can do for your soul and to obey the Lord is to throw your voice there. Some of you need to make today the day where you decide that Jesus is the one who's sing it, worth singing about. Maybe for the first time. And you say, I've sat on the outside watching and listening to this singing. I've held it at arm's length. And now is the time. And the way that I express my confidence and my turning to Christ is by the fact I'm going to let my voice loose for him and say, Lord, be the Lord over my voice as well as every other area of my life. And so before we sing two songs, which are all about singing songs to the Lord, I'm going to sing. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Joe's like, go on then, lad. Okay. Twinkle, twinkle. <laughs> if I'd have done that, Matty would never have let me live that one down, would he? Huh? I can assure you, if I was going to see it, wouldn't have been, I'd have had him up here with me, I assure you. Right. I'm going to read, as the musicians head up, I'm going to read that psalm that I had read earlier. I could sing it to you, if you like. That's it. Only with your help, Michael. Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. No, couldn't help myself. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>